Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God, back with you with the next video in my series reading The Call of the Wild by Jack London. Without further ado, returning to The Call of the Wild as read by Lord Naren White. Day after day, for days unending, Buck toiled in the traces, always they broke camp in the dark, and the first grey of dawn found them hitting the trail with fresh miles reeled off behind them, and always they pitched camp after dark, eating their bit of fish, and crawling to sleep in the snow. Buck was ravenous, the pound and a half of sun-dried salmon, which was his ration for each day, seemed to go nowhere. He never had enough and suffered from perpetual hang hunger pangs, yet the other dogs, because they weighed less and were born to the life, received a pound only of the fish and managed to keep in good condition. He swiftly lost the fastidiousness which had characterized his old life. A dainty eater he found with that his mates, finishing first, robbed him of his unfinished ration. There was no defending it. While he was fighting off two or three, it was disappearing down the throats of the others. To remedy this, he ate as fast as they, and so greatly did hunger compel him. He, he was not above taking what did not belong to him. He watched and learned. When he saw Pike, one of the new dogs, a, a clever malignant maligniger and thief, slyly steal a, a slice of bacon when Peralt's back was turned, he duplicated the performance the following day, getting away with the whole chunk. A great uproar was raised, but he was unsuspected, while Dub, an awkward blunderer who was always getting caught and punished for Buck's misdeed. The first theft marked Buck as fit to survive in the hostile Northland environment. It marked his adaptability, his capacity to adjust himself to changing conditions, the lack of which would have meant swift and terrible death. It marked, further, the decay or going to, to pieces of his moral nature, a vain thing and a handicap in the ruthless struggle for existence. It was all well enough in the Southland, under the law of love and fellowship, to respect private property and personal feelings. But in Northland, under the law of, the cl a law of club and fang, whoso took such things into account was a fool, and in so far as he observed that them he would fail to prosper. Not that Buck reasoned it out. He was fit, that was all, and unconsciously he accommodated himself to the new mode of life. All his days, no matter what the odds, he had never run from a fight. But the club of the man in the red sweater had beaten into him a more fundamental and primitive code. Civilized, he could have died for a moral consideration, say the defense of Judge Miller's riding whip, but the completeness of his decivilization was now evidenced by his ability to flee from the defense of a moral consideration and so save his hide. He did not steal for joy of it, but because of the clamor of his stomach. He did not rob openly, but stole secretly and, and cunningly out of respect for club and fang. In short, the things he did were done because it was easier to do them than not to do them. His development or retrogression was rapid. His muscles became hard as iron, and he grew callous to all ordinary pain. He achieved an internal as well as external economy. He could eat anything, no matter how loathsome or indigestible, and, once eaten, the juices of his stomach extracted the, le the last least par uh, particle of nutriment, and his blood carried it to the farthest reaches of his body building it into the toughest and stoutest of tissues. Sight and scent became remarkably, remarkably keen, while his hearing developed such acuteness that in his sleep he heard the faintest sound and knew whether it, was, it heralded peace or peril. He learned to bite the ice out with his teeth and collect it between his toes, and when he was thirsty and there was a thick scum of ice over the water hole, he would break it by rearing and striking it with stiff forelegs. His most conspicuous trait was an ability to scent the wind and forecast at night in advance. No matter how breathless the air when he dug his nest by tree or bank, the wind that later blew inevitably found him uh, leeward, to leeward, sheltered and snug. And not only did he learn by experience, but instincts long dead became alive again. Three, the domesticated generations fell from him. In vague ways he remembered back to the youth of the breed, to the time the wild dogs ranged in packs through the primeval forest and killed their meat as they ran it down. It was no task for him to learn to fight with cut and slash and the quick wolf snap. In this manner had fought forgotten ancestors. 
They quickened the old life within him, and the old tricks which they had stamped into the heredity of the breed were his tricks. They came to him without effort or discovery, as though they had been his always, and when on the still cold nights he pointed his nose at a star and howled long and wolf-like, it was his ancestors, dead and dust, pointing nose at star and howling down through the centuries and through him. And his cadences were their cadences, the cadences which voiced their woe and what to them was the meaning of the stillness and the cold and dark. Thus, as token of what a puppet thing life is, the ancient song surged through him, and he came into his own again. And he came because men had found a yellow metal in the north, and because Manuel was a gardener's helper whose wages did not lap over the needs of his wife and divers small copies of himself. Chapter 3 The Dominant Primordial Beast The dominant primordial beast was strong in buck, and under the fierce conditions of trail life it grew and grew. Yet it was a secret growth. His born new cunning gave him poise and control. He was too busy adjusting himself to the, li to, to the new life to feel at ease, and not only did he not pick fights, but he avoided them whenever possible. A certain deliberateness characterized his attitude. He was not prone to rashness and precipit precipitate action, and in the bitter hatred between him and Spitz, he betrayed no impatience, shunned all offensive acts. On the other hand, possibly because he divined in Buck a dangerous rival, Spitz never lost an opportunity of showing his teeth. He even went out of his way to bully Buck, striving constantly to start the fight, which could only end in the death of one or the other. Early in the trip, this might have taken place had it not been for an unwanted accident. At the end of this day, they made a bleak and miserable camp on the shore of the Lake Le Barge, Driving snow, a wind that cut like a white-hot knife, and darkness had forced them to grope for a camping place. They could hardly have fared worse, and at their backs rose a perpendicular wall of rock, and Perrault and Francois were compelled to make their fire and spread their sleeping robes on the ice to the lake itself. The tent they had discarded at Dea in order to travel light. A few sticks of driftwood furnished them with a fire that thawed down through the ice and left them to eat supper in the dark. Close in under the sheltering rock, Buck made his nest. So snug and warm was it that he was loath to leave it when Francois dis distributed the fish, which he had first thawed over the fire. But when Buck finished his ration and returned, he found his nest occupied. A warning snarl told him that the trespasser was Spitz. Till now, Buck had avoided trouble with his enemy, but this was too much. The beast in him roared. He sprang upon Spitz with a fury which surprised them both, and Spitz particularly for his whole experience with Buck had gone to teach him that his rival was an unusually timid dog, who managed to hold his own only because of his great weight and size. Francois was surprised too, when they shot out in a tangle from the disrupted nest and he divined the cause of the trouble. Ah! he cried to Buck. Give it to him by God! Give it to him, the dirty eef! Spitz was equally willing. He was crying with sheer rage and eagerness as he circled back and forth for a chance to spring in. Buck was no less eager and no less cautious, as he likewise circled back and forth for the advantage. But it was then that the unexpected happened. The thing which projected their struggle for supremacy far into the future, past many a weary mile of trail and toil. An oath from Peralt, the resounding impact of a club upon a bony frame, and a shrill yelp of pain, heralded the breaking forth of pandemonium. The camp was suddenly discovered to be alive with skulking, furry forms, starving huskies, four or five score of them, who had scented the camp from some Indian village. They had crept in while Buck and Spitz were fighting, and when two men sprang among them with stout clubs, they showed their teeth and fought back. They were crazed by the smell of his food. Peralt found one uh, with head buried in the grub box. His club landed heavily on the gaunt ribs, and the grub box was capsized on the ground. On the instant, a score of the famished brutes were scrambling for the bread and bacon. The clubs fell upon them unheeded. They yelped and howled under the rain of blows, but struggled nonetheless madly till the last crumb had been devoured. We'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Please like, comment, and subscribe as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care and thanks again.